going to talk about search-friendly design today. And when we talk about search-friendly design, what we are mainly talking about in this session is going to be the programming. This is the architecture and the code that goes into developing the site because that's the most critical part of your search engine optimization efforts. Unless your code is friendly for search engines, unless it allows the search engine spiders to come through your website, follow the links from page to page, and see the content on the page, it really won't matter what type of effort you put into your on-page search engine optimization efforts. You need to look at the structure and the code and the programming first before you look at your on-page objectives. Really, I look at it in terms of building a house. What we're looking at here is the foundation. If the foundation is right, we can do anything we want with the house. We can take out walls, we can move things around, we can put an addition. But if that foundation is not created correctly, then the house will experience cracks, crumbles, maybe even a cave-in if the foundation is not created right. So we want to look at the foundation, and the foundation of any good website are three primary areas, architecture, links, and content. Architecture, as I said, is the most critical component because that's what allows the search engines to come into your website, to see the content that's on the page, and also to follow the links from page to page to page to page. So those are the areas that we are most focused on, and we're going to talk specifically about the architecture to make sure it is working correctly. Now to talk specifically about architecture, I want to bring this back and start with an example so that we can see how critical this is. A story that I've been following here for the past couple of years is when the National Federation of the Blind sued Target over an inaccessible website. And what was it specifically that they are upset about? Well, there were three things. The first thing is the lack of alternative text, alt attributes. Really what these are simply is if the image on a website does not appear, what is the text behind the image? How do you describe that image if the image does not appear? So on the Target website, they had lots of images, but there was nothing behind those images to let people know what it was they were not seeing. The second thing was an image map. An image map are, is a group of images, and each image has its own link to another page. Now, that's wonderful if you are sighted and you can look through this image map. One great example is being given a map of countries and you select what country you're in. It's wonderful if you're sighted, but if you're not sighted, all you know is that there are a lot of graphics there, but there's no description to let you know where you need to click. And also, the last thing is you needed a mouse specifically to use the site. If you are not a sighted user, or if you have vision difficulties, you're not using a mouse. You are using a keyboard as your main means of entering information and navigating the website. Blind users do not use mice because they cannot see where to click. It's fairly, fairly obvious some of the things that are needed there. And all three of these things are very critical to also allowing search engines to get through the site. Search engines look at the alt attributes. They look to see what is there if the image is not there, and they take that into account. The search engines also cannot use a mouse to navigate the page. If you can navigate your website with a keyboard, chances are a search engine can get through it as well. But as soon as you require a mouse click, you've stopped the search engine. Let's look specifically at the Google Guidelines. And if you're interested at all in search engine optimization, then it is an absolute must that you are familiar with the Google Guidelines because Google will tell you how specifically they want you to build your website. Google is not in the business of excluding websites. It's in a search engine's best interest to have as many documents and websites as possible in their server. They don't want to exclude everything. They want to have as much as possible. So you need to be familiar with these guidelines and be familiar with what they are asking for. One of the first things Google recommends is a clear hierarchy and text links. Text links are one of the primary ways that you can help search engines get from page to page because a text link is one of the best ways 
to show that. A site map. A site map is a central location where you have text links to other pages on your website. Write pages that clearly and accurately describe your content. Use words that users use. Try to use text instead of images. And also make sure your title and alt attributes are descriptive and accurate. If Target would just follow these simple bullet points, and these are just some of the highlights pulled out of the Google guidelines, if Target would have just followed some of these, their website would be more easily crawlable by the search engines, and it would also be more accessible to disabled users. Now, when we talk about accessibility, one thing we're going to always bring up is the W3C, or the World Wide Web Consortium, which also publishes a checklist of accessibility guidelines. And I strongly suggest that you get that checklist. And all you have to do is search for Web Accessibility Checklist. And you will find this printed out and go through your website and make sure you can live up to at least the Phase 1 part of the checklist. And it's very similar to the Google results or the Google checklist. Provide a text equivalent for non-text elements, redundant text links, organize your documents, use clear and simple language, ensure that dynamic content is accessible and clearly identify the target of each link. And that is done specifically with text links on the page. They're very similar, as you can see, and it's almost like Google guidelines were written from the Web Accessibility Checklist. Well, there's a reason for that. The reason is that search engine spiders are the most disabled users that will come to your website. They can't see, they can't hear, they can't look at images, they can't view flash movies, they can't follow complicated JavaScripts, and also they can't accept cookies, they can't eat cookies, so to speak. And so when your site is built to be accessible, to users that are using assistive technology like a screen reader uh, or any type of voice technology, if your site is accessible, it will also be search engine friendly. And that's what we're looking at, is that the more accessible your site is, the more search friendly it's going to be. And building an accessible website is not a problem. It's not a hassle. A lot of companies I talk to, as soon as we start talking about accessibility, they start rolling their eyes and thinking about the excessive cost that's going to go into building an accessible site. And really, when you look at the business principles and why you should build an accessible website, it pays off larger dividends by doing that because it's more open to the search engines. And also, when you're looking at accessibility, the goal is to, be, to build a website that's accessible anywhere on any type of device, regardless of whether it's a computer, a cell phone, a screen reader. Uh, it doesn't matter the type of device or the type of browser or the type of computer. If your website can be seen on all devices anywhere, regardless of operating system or browser type, then your site's accessible. And to be accessible on that level increases the ability and your reach and your visibility in order to be found by as many search engines and users as possible. Let's look specifically at target and the alt attribute. If we're looking here at their baby page, but if we strip out all the images, this is what we find. We find large blocks of images. And because there is no alt attributes in these images, we, can, we can't take any idea, we can't figure out where we are at. The only thing that is visible is the navigation on the left-hand side. And that is some of the only text that's on the page. But we don't have any text that describes what images are on the page. Now, if we look at some of the other pages on the site, what we see is this is where Target is putting a lot of their call to action. They're putting their calls to action within images. So we have save 10 to 20%, save 10 to 20%, free shipping. But unless you can see those images, they are not available for you. And so this is one of the primary things that the National Federation of the Blind is very upset at, is that if there is a blind user on the site, they are not aware of the sale information, the free shipping information, 
or really in, available to any of the information that's on there. The only thing you have to go by is the content and the navigation on the left side, and maybe you will get to a page that has significant amount of content in it. Now, sometimes we block search engines just because we're trying to do some things that might accomplish some business objectives. Here's a website where they are asking you specifically to select your country, and then you have a continue button. Now, unfortunately, a search engine spider, if you think about it here, we are requiring three clicks. We're requiring someone to click the drop down to select a country and then click the continue button. A search engine is not able to make those types of clicks. The search engines are looking for text links. They're looking for links to go deep into the website. But because we require so many clicks to get into the content, we're going to prevent an easy spidering of this website. Here's another website where they have some language considerations. They're asking which language here. But again, it's a three-click process to get into the rest of the website, and there are no text links taking anyone in to the rest of the website. Again, creating a roadblock for the search engines. Prince Tennis has a Flash-based website, and it's one of those ones that I've been watching for a while because ever since they've done it, their rankings have dropped significantly. The main reason is when they built this Flash interface, what we see in back is select a region or country, and that is the option available to them. Again, we're asking for a three-click process, but it is contained within the Flash movie. So how that affects prints, if we look here, we have a title tag or the page heading here of Prince Tennis, select your country. And then the description, the snippet of information underneath is select a region or country, select a region, and then what information is in the drop-down box. Americas, Europe, Afri Africa, Middle East, Asia, Pacific, select a country. And so realizing that this is the first marketing message that a searcher will see about your company in the search results means that you can't afford to mess around with not having the ability to control this information. You want to control it as much as you can and you do that best through HTML with the page title, with the description, with the content that's on the page. By putting all this information into select a region or country, what we have here is a very mundane description. And when you consider what's above and below, if anyone is looking for a Prince tennis racket and they're looking for a good price, they know that they can get Prince tennis rackets here at Tennis Express and also at Racket Depot because they're advertising exactly what the user is looking for. Some of the other things that we can do to prevent search engines from getting deep into the site is by cluttering up our URL. Some of the most significant ways we do that is by having a URL that is more dependent upon a computer language to put the page together rather than a human language to understand exactly where we're at. One of the rules of thumb I have is simply by looking at the number of equal signs. Every time you have an equal sign in your URL, that is a new parameter, meaning it's a new, uh, a new call to the database to go looking for information to put on the page. And if you have two to three to four parameters, you're making it more and more difficult for the search engines to get through your site. Now, I have seen sites with as high as two to three parameters in Google, uh, but you are definitely pushing it, and then it depends upon how well it is programmed to make that happen. This is an example of something I would never recommend, because not only do we have equal signs, and it goes far beyond this, uh, the big rule of thumb is if your URL does not fit in the URL bar, then you are probably going to be having problems with the search engine. But also, if you have underscores, forward slashes, question marks, percentage signs, and then also large blocks of numbers, texts, uh, ampersands, things like that. The more of those types of things that are in the URL, the harder it's going to be for search engines to get through that URL and find more links to sequential pages. If we do look for baby cribs, 
what we find is a site like this where they are creating a logical URL. That is, instead of having programming language up in the URL, they're using keywords. Uh, this one doesn't use so many user-based keywords, but we understand where we are at. By brand, and Pally is the brand that we're looking at. So we know that we're on a Baby Cribs page, and if we look at the URL, it's very clear to see where we are at. Something else that I ask people is, which one would you rather type in to send to a friend? Would you rather type in this URL or the previous one from Target? Also, something that they are doing here is they are creating a file uh, called a favicon, F-A-V-I-C-O-N. It's an icon file, and they load it into the root directory of the website. And whenever you have that favicon there, uh, users of Firefox and also uh, Internet Explorer, the latest version, it will automatically download this little favicon as people are using your website. It's a great way to get some branding on the user's browser because if they bookmark the website, that favicon shows up inside their browser in their bookmarks. So it's a fantastic way of reinforcing your website and your brand. And so when a user is bookmarking multiple sites as they're shopping or, or looking for leads, and then they go back to their bookmarks, your brand shows up and they are able to see that. And you'll probably be one of the only ones on there so that people can easily remember it and it will immediately grab their attention. Now some other questions here about CSS standards. As we talk about accessibility, these are always some questions that come up. The first one is, can validated code help you to rank higher? And then also, do sites using CSS rank higher? Believe it or not, these are actually sales propositions put out by a lot of SEO companies that if you have validated code or you scrap your old site and create a new site in CSS, that these things are going to help you rank higher. And I, I really want to bring some education to this and some clarity in that these are both things that are important, but they're not critical to helping you rank higher. They have indirect benefits. I'll talk to you about how that can happen. The first is by cascading style sheets, the CSS. CSS is a programming language that allows a lot of the markup, meaning the instructions. The instructions that say, make the text this size, make it this color, make it appear to the left of the page. All of those instructions are in a separate file. And so when you look at a specific page on your website, all that is in the code is the content. And then there is an instruction that says, in order to format this page, look at this specific file. And that instruction is on every page of the website. So rather than when you want to make a change to a color or size of font, you make it one time and it broadcasts out to all of the pages on your website. But it allows the content to be the primary focus on the page. We don't have all that markup. We don't have all that gobbledygook of code on the page that the search engines have to parse through. And so it makes it very easy for the search engines to find the actual content very quickly on the page and not have to deal with lots of scripts or markup language in order to determine where the content is and how it should show up. Here's an example of a, an old table-based layout. And, and really, these are the two competing methods of laying out page information. Tables really is just more of a block format where you can say, I want this in the upper left block, I want this in the lower left block. And here's a great idea of how that happens. And this is the Costco Computers website. And you can see how they have the page laid out. As you can see, there are links here, space, a link, member services, pharmacy. What we're looking at is the main navigation here, photo center. And then you can see where they've put in little blocks as spacers in between the content. Then also we have additional top nav information here, and it's all blocked out. Now the problem is because it's a table-based layout, when a search engine comes to look at the page, the search engine squishes everything together and tries to look at it in a sequential format. And it looks kind of like a mess. Here's a better way of showing it. All If you have a table-based layout, the search engine starts here at the upper left block. That's where the search engine starts. And then the search engine reads down. And then it goes back up to the next column and reads down. Instead of the way humans look at everything, we start in the upper left and go to the right. 
especially if our navigation is contained up here. And then we have other information in these blocks. And typically, we have our content down towards the bottom of the page and some other blocks. So what happens is the search engine has to go through all of the information in the top columns or in the, the leftmost columns until they get to the content that's in the right columns. So the search engines are looking from top to bottom. We're looking from left to right. So how you see the page is not necessarily how the search engine is going to get through the page. And it linearizes the information, meaning it stacks all of the columns on top of each other. Now, I'm not saying that tables are wrong. I'm just showing you two different methods of programming in order to assist the search engines in getting through the information of your site. Tables are still a valid layout technique, and there are ways that you can make tables uh, validate. Uh, however, I'm just showing an alternate view of cascading style sheets and how it can affect the layout of the page and make it easier for your website to show in other devices. If your website is using a table-based layout and you go look at it in a cell phone that is web-enabled, you will see how it falls apart and how it linearizes because a lot of the web-enabled phones will linearize the page and you'll get a great idea of how search engines see your site by looking at it in a cell phone. CSS will naturally adapt, however, to a cell phone because it's not using tables. It's using a more strict markup language that tells items where to be. Here's the CNET page on laptops and notebooks, and we can see our main navigation across the top. We can get an idea of where that is at. We can also see that we're on the laptops page. Now, when we linearize the page, we don't see all that information mushing together. In fact, what we see is content. We see the laptops information. We see laptops by price, by manufacturer, or by the specific type of laptop that we're looking to find. All the information is very easy to find. We can see related links there. And so this is why we talked about CSS has the focus of the information is on the content rather than on the programming. And we can see how the difference is and how search engines will see the programming on each of the pages. So what I would tell you is go look at your company website on your cell phone, on your web-enabled phone, and go see what it looks like. CNET will render very easily because it also creates a style sheet just for mobile. Validation is where you're looking to validate your code against an accepted standard. And having validated code, all that means is that you meet the validation standard. There's not a magic formula that happens with validated code. And while I am a proponent of validation, I'm not a proponent of strict validation because there are many times that having strict validation, uh, it really isn't necessary. However, I will always tell people to run your code through a validator. The number one reason why is that it will find programming errors. There have been many sites where we have looked at the code and found that a lot of the tags weren't closed and just some simple programming errors. And by correcting those, it helped the search engine recognize which text was where. There are many times if you leave tags open, the search engines won't read the text because it doesn't see it as text. And so validation will help you uncover errors, but it doesn't necessarily increase rankings as a direct result. Correcting your errors as a result of running validation, that will help improve your rankings. Making sure that your code is written how it should be, making sure you don't have open tags, making sure that you have not run things together. What validation does is make sure that your page is read correctly. And when the search engines read your pages correctly, that will improve your chances of ranking.